All right. Hello, everyone. Are you all able to hear me? I will nod if you can hear. All right. Excellent. Let's begin. So thank you all so much for attending our event tonight. My name is Noelle Trost. I am the president of Neurogenesis, a book club and speaker series founded here at USC this semester. This is our first speaker event in discussion with an author, and we're incredibly grateful to have you all here with us tonight. For tonight, that we, we ask you keep your mics turned off until the very end, and at that point, we will allow people to unmute themselves to ask questions. You're also free to directly message us any uh, questions in the chat. To tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we represent, we are a book club dedicated to topics of neuroscience and mental health. We're mostly consisted of undergraduates studying neuroscience and psychology. However, our organization is open to everyone. Our goal is to get people to expand their perspectives about the brain and mind through reading and discussion. We chose The Center Cannot Hold by Professor Ellen Sachs as our first book to read as a club because we felt that it would be important to read about mental health from those with the closest experiences with it. Professor Ellen Sachs is Oren B. Evans Distinguished Professor of Law, Psychology, Psychiatry, and Behavioral Sciences at the USC Gould School of Law. She is the founder and faculty director of the Sachs Institute for Mental Health Law, Policy, and Ethics, which was founded using the funds she was awarded from the MacArthur Fellowship, or the Genius Grant. She is also someone who has spent her life and career with schizophrenia, which is the central topic of her memoir, The Center Cannot Hold. With no further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Ellen Sachs. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me, great, okay. So I'm honored and delighted to be speaking to your neurogenesis group. I think it's wonderful that you have joined together to think and talk about issues regarding basically the brain and that you want to think about and understand brain diseases called mental illnesses as well and make sure that we replace stigma against mental illness with understanding and care. So I'm gonna first tell my story as someone suffering from a major mental illness, namely schizophrenia. And then I'll talk about a couple of policy issues raised by my story, uh, and then we can open it up for questions. So good psychiatric treatment has kept me alive. Sensitive and wise psychiatric treatment uh, has allowed me to flourish. Most people today know or should know that people who struggle with mental health disorders are not just walking symptoms that can be cured by a pill. Mental health and mental illness involve whole people in relational, social, and political contexts. We need to understand people in the richness and in the fullness of their lives. The title of my talk today is Schizophrenia and I, Making Peace with Mental Illness. My title is an attempt to convey that schizophrenia is a relational illness. By relational, I mean it involves personal identity, that it profoundly implicates one's social world, and that it has political meanings as well. That's what I want to address today, the identity, the social, and the political aspects of schizophrenia. So I will uh, be addressing these three aspects of mental illness by using excerpts from my memoir, The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness, as a window into these issues. And I've left time at the end for, uh, for a discussion, and I'm really eager to hear what your thoughts are and and uh, beliefs are and ideas. I first became ill, seriously ill, as a Marshall Scholar studying ancient philosophy at Oxford. At first, it seemed like I had severe depression with mild psychotic features, which is often how schizophrenia begins, but then my illness evolved into a pure thought disorder. Despite much resistance, I eventually found my way to a psychiatric hospital with strong encouragement from my doctors at the university whom I'd seen at the urging of a friend who had, was a neurologist. I had graduated as class valedictorian at Vanderbilt, had been accepted as a Marshall Scholar at Oxford, but I was in terrible shape. I spent much of my time wandering the streets of Oxford, mumbling to myself, gesticulating, and contemplating various ways to commit suicide to rid the world of my evil. I had absolutely no insight into the severity of my illness. I had no awareness that there might be a gap between how I saw myself and how others saw me. I did enter the hospital voluntarily. After about a week or two there, everything changed. It wasn't something that a doctor or a fellow patient or a, a friend had said. It was a simple look into a mirror. I saw myself reading from the text. It was the first time I'd actually seen myself in weeks and it felt as if someone had punched me in the stomach. Good God, I thought, who is that? I was emaciated and hunched over like someone three or even four times my age. 
My face was gone. My eyes were simultaneously vacant and full of terror. My hair was wild and filthy and my clothes wrinkled and stained. It was the visage of a crazy person on the long forgotten back ward of a hospital for lunatics. Ending the pa passage. The gap between who I imagined myself to be and whom I saw in the mirror that day was profound and unavoidable. Far from making peace with my mental illness, until that moment, I did not truly understand that I had a mental illness to make peace with. That moment, that look into the mirror was the beginning of a journey that would last a quarter of a century. In retrospect, it's no accident that the song I chose to listen to over and over, most often on the psych ward after that experience was the Beatles. Once there was a way to get back home or once there was a way to get back home, I needed to find my way home. Now, I think Freud was a brilliant thinker and he got many things right. What I don't think Freud got right is his view that intense talk therapy is not appropriate for people who are psychotic. According to Freud, analysis was not appropriate for psychotic patients because an individual who was actively psychotic could not form a transference to the analyst. Freud's view in my experience is, abs Freud's view is absolutely not consistent with my experience. In my experience, the need to be in a relationship, to be part of a social world, may be the most profound precisely when someone is psychotic. I began my work with an analyst at Oxford and it was difficult and painful work. What I noticed from my first experience with intensive talk psychotherapy is two things. First, my analyst was hugely helpful in diffusing a sense of shame that went along with the thoughts I was having. My thoughts were violent and deeply disturbing about myself and other people. My analyst, who I'll call Mrs. Jones, was able to tolerate everything. It's difficult for me to adequately convey how helpful it was to me to have someone listen, not judge me, and not threaten to put me in the hospital or call the police, as might well have happened in the United States. Second, I noticed that as I felt more related to my analyst, Mrs. Jones, I began to make friends and found it easier to work again. I realized that someone could object by questioning the direction of the causal arrows here. Fair enough. My point is that as I became able to share my internal experience, my ability to interact with the world around me got better. I want to note and emphasize that the most helpful consultant I had in England said two things. First, I needed to be in an intensive psychotherapy. And second, I should remain in school as a way to exercise my mind. The hospital doctors were all saying, you know, you should withdraw and you should go back to the States. I will be forever grateful to that consultant. I think he was right. I finished my degree at Oxford and came back to the States to study law at Yale. The transition was rocky. For someone not familiar with a psychotic illness, it's difficult to understand. And at this point, I didn't truly believe I had a mental illness. My thought was that I was somehow different from other people and not in a good way. I took through the exercise of willpower, I could tame whatever was wrong. Quite literally, like one has a wild horse in a corral that you must tame. The challenge, as I framed it at that point in my life, was take that woman who I had seen in the mirror and tame her and groom her, or maybe just make sure she always stayed at home when I went out. So I began Yale Law School. I was not in treatment, nor was I on medication. Parenthetically, Mrs. Jones in England never suggested I consider meds, even though I was psychotic at Oxford most of the time. Within several weeks after law school began, I became overwhelmed. One night in the library of the Yale Law School, I became quite psychotic, and the following day, I ended up being taken to the hospital by one of my professors, whose assignment has sent me over the edge. At the hospital, I found myself in a small uh, private room waiting for a doctor. The attendant was kind, and I readily gave him a telephone wire belt, which I had proudly made the evening before, when I'd been floridly psychotic on the roof of the Yale Law School and, not satisfied with my jeans and t-shirt, decided to accessorize. I had also picked up a nail that I kept in my pocket. Many people who are psychotic carry things that can be used as weapons, not because they want to hurt someone, but because they're afraid someone may want to hurt them. This visit to the emergency room resulted in my first hospitalization in America, reading from the text. But you can't have my six inch nail, I said, patting my pocket. Then someone who I'll call just the doctor arrived. Give that to me, he ordered. No, I said. The doctor immediately called for security. Another attendant came in, this one not so nice. Once he pried the nail from my fingers, I knew I was done for. Within seconds, the doctor and his whole team of goons swooped down, grabbed me, lifted me out of the chair and slammed me down on a nearby bed with such force I saw stars. Then they bound both my legs and my arms to the metal bed with thick leather straps. A sound came out of my mouth I'd never heard before. Half groan, half scream, barely human and pure terror. 
Then the sound came again, forced from somewhere deep inside my belly and scraping my throat raw. No, I shouted, stop this, don't do this to me. I glanced up to see a face watching the entire scene through the window in the steel door. Why was she watching me? Who was she? I was an exhibit, a specimen, a bug impaled on a pin and helpless to escape. Please, I begged, please. This is like someone from the Middle Ages. Please don't do this to me. Ending the passage. Shame is a pervasive experience of people with psychosis. Often we're ashamed of what we're thinking and so we hide our thoughts from other people. The shame may play itself out in various ways. After my experience in the emergency room, five months of hospitalization ensued. Hospitalization involving long-term restraints and seclusion, forcible medication, and no privacy. In the beginning, say the first month, I was even watched as I showered and went to the bathroom and was not allowed privacy while talking to other people, including my parents. I believe that the hands-off approach, perhaps it could be described as benign neglect, that I experienced at the Oxford Hospital was preferable to the over-interventionist approach, often driven by risk management concerns of the American hospitals. As I've come to say, I am very pro-psychiatry, but very anti-force. After two weeks on an emergency commitment, I was faced with the question of whether I would try to get out of the hospital. Parenthetically, the doctors put me on an emergency commitment because they said I was dangerous to myself and others, and because they said I was, quote, gravely disabled. And the reason they gave for the latter was that I couldn't do my Yale Law School homework, which made me want to wonder about much of the rest of New Haven. I can contest their motion to civilly commit me, and to me, the choice seemed clear. I would demand a hearing to fight the commitment. I brought this up to my father, who was an attorney as well. My father was equally clear. Do not contest this, because if you lose, you have now been civilly committed, and you're going to have to report your commitment every time you apply for a license to practice law. He said to me, quote, you certainly don't want anything in your record where a judge orders you to stay in the hospital, unquote. When I speak about the political dimensions of schizophrenia, I speak not only about the social stigma, which is real and pervasive. I also speak about these life events that can follow an individual with schizophrenia for decades. There are profound political aspects to this illness that can become huge, bur huge burdens that people with schizophrenia carry. And it's important that uh, you who uh, work with people with schizophrenia, if that's what you end up doing, are aware of that. So we've just discussed personal identity aspects of the illness, social aspects, and political aspects. I wanna push these ideas even farther by talking about the centrality of relationship to healing. Healing does not occur in isolation. It's painful to me when I speak with mental health professionals working in community mental health centers who measure their caseload in the hundreds. I have a good friend, she's now retired, who worked at one of the mental health clinics in Los Angeles, and she had 350 patients. How on earth do you do that? It's crazy. Healing begins in relationship and in all kinds of ways, a patient's relationship with a mental health professional is an integral part of the healing. I worry tremendously that this point has been lost on our policymakers. Of course, other relationships are healing as well. After I was hospitalized upon returning to the States, I took the rest of that year off, what would have been my first year in law school, and then I returned the following fall to begin again. It was when I began Yale school, Law School a second time that I made my closest friend and a man named Steve. Steve is an attorney and a clinical psychologist with an appointment in clinical ethics at Harvard's Department of Psychiatry. Reading from the text. One of the worst aspects of schizophrenia is the profound isolation, the constant awareness that you're different, some sort of alien, not really human. Other people have flesh and bones and insides made of organs and healthy living tissue. You are only a machine with insides made of metal. Medication and talk therapy allay this terrible feeling, but friendship can be as powerful as either. Steve Banky and I were in contracts class together and a couple of times he asked for an assignment. Other than that, we'd never really spoken. But we were at dinner that night and the conversation in the law, law school dining hall was casual and pleasant, drifting from one subject to another, classes and law journal and summer drives. I noticed that Steve seemed engaged enough. He nodded, he smiled, but after a while I began to look like simple politeness. As our classmates got up to leave, I realized I was, wasn't ready to go just then. And there began one of those conversations that lasts for a lifetime, one in which there's immediate comfort and acceptance, the equivalent of someone's strong hand offered to you when you most need to grasp it. That first talk flew far and wide, how we got to Yale, who our families were, then philosophy and religion and what mattered to us and why. Steve had majored in classics at Princeton, where he was named salutatorian of his class and spoke in Latin at graduation. He went to Rome then, where he lived with a group of Benedictine monks and read Latin at the Vatican with a monk who served as the Pope's Latinist. He considered entering the monastery and studying medieval philosophy, 
but decided against it because medieval philosophy had ceased to hold his interest, as, at least as a lifelong endeavor. Instead of becoming a monk, Steve came to Yale Law School, and so did I, and neither of us was quite sure why. Sometime later, it occurred to me that at the very moment I was being tied to a bed in a psychiatric ward, screaming bloody murder and afraid for my life, Steve was singing Gregorian chant in a monastery overlooking the ancient city of Rome. And here we were now, come to the same place from very different directions. It was past midnight when we said goodnight, and as I walked back to my room, I had the distinct feeling in the middle of my usual muddle that I'd been unexpectedly blessed. I don't know why I decided to tell Steve the truth about myself. I don't know why I thought I could trust him, but I did. I believe from our very first conversation that this man would be a significant friend and a force for good in my life. Once the possibility came to my mind, I realized how much I wanted it to be so, but I didn't believe it could happen unless I revealed the truth about myself and let him see me in full. So much of what I did on a daily basis was about faking it. I knew I could never fake it with him. And so on a rainy afternoon in a pizzeria in New Haven, I shared my history. Aside from doctors and therapists, it was the first time I'd done this with anyone, anywhere. Ending the passage. Without Steve's uh, support, I could not have made it so successfully through law school if I indeed could have made it at all. Steve was a second set of eyes who could see me slipping when I couldn't. He was a rock who could support me when I was about to fall. And he was a true friend who helped me find meaning and pleasure in my life when meaning and pleasure felt like distant memories. After Steve graduated from law school and left New Haven, my then analyst, I'll call Dr. White, announced he was gonna close his practice in three months, fully two years before I had planned to leave. The news of why shatter was leaving shattered me. Again, I returned to what I see as Freud's mistaken view that psychotic patients don't form transferences with their analysts. In fact, my transferences were quite powerful and the end of my first two analytic relationships could easily have landed me in the hospital. Fortunately, neither did. When White gave me the news of his planned early retirement, Steve was traveling around the country interviewing for PhD programs in clinical site. He had a sense that something was terribly wrong and he came to New Haven to see me, reading from the text. I opened the door of my studio apartment. Steve would later tell me that for all the times he'd seen me psychotic, what he saw that day shocked him. For a week or more, I had barely eaten. I was gaunt and moved as though my legs were wooden. My face looked and felt like a mask. Since I pulled down all the shades, the apartment in the middle of the afternoon was in near total darkness. The air was fed at the place of shambles. Steve has worked with many patients who suffer from severe mental illness. To this day, he'll tell me that on that afternoon, I looked as bad as any he'd ever seen. Hi, I said, then returned to the couch where I was silent for about five minutes. Thank you for coming, Steve, I finally said. Crumbling world, word, voice, tell the clocks to stop. Time is, time has come. White is leaving, Steve said somberly. I'm being pushed into a grave. The situation is grave, I'm on. Gravity is pulling me down. Tell them to get away, I'm scared. There's an example of loose associations, which words, you know, loosely associated with each other are put together, but don't really make sense. Ending the passage. Healing takes place in many forms and in many venues. I could not have survived this illness without close friends, family, and colleagues who've known me over the course of my illness and have been there to help me. Healing takes place in relationship. As wonderful as Steve was and is, he was a friend, like a brother. Around the time I received tenure, or shortly after, I ran into a man named Will, a man I thought was handsome, friendly, and smart, a man with whom I tried to flirt a few times when I was working toward tenure and he was working in the law library at USC. I mustered my courage and asked if he'd like to have lunch sometime. I actually went 18 years without dating. I dated normally in high school and college, but when I went sick, that part of my life went by the wayside. But fortunately, it came back, uh, quoting from the text. When it came to my personal life after my illness had quieted down somewhat, I started nurturing a fragile but growing hope for a relationship with a man named Will, a librarian at USC and an artist. I had tried flirting with him to no avail. Who knew how to do that? But after he left USC, he invited me to lunch, and then he invited me to see the California Poppy Reserve in Lancaster, not far from Los Angeles. I kept saying how cold I was, hinting he should put his arm around me, and he never did, and I was kind of really deflated. But at the end of the day, when he brought me home, he kissed me a long, lingering kiss goodnight. And the thought I had, and this is really the thought that went through my mind, is, huh, this is even better than getting an article accepted. <laughs> so the next day, Will brought me a feather from his parrot, which he pasted on my computer. That, that night, I asked my close Vanderbilt friend, Kenny, who I'm still in touch with, whether he thought that a guy plucking his, a feather from his bird and pasting it on your computer meant you like, like he, he liked you. And 
my friend Kenny said, well, one thing for sure is he likes you better than he likes his bird. <laughs> but that, that wasn't really true. I wanted a relationship with Will and slowly began to believe that it actually might happen. Eventually, I told Will that I loved him and indeed that he was the first man I had ever loved in that way. He said that made him very sad. At the right moment, I told him about my illness and he responded as gently and kindly as a person could. If Steve's uh, friendship made me feel human, Will was making me feel like a woman, ending the passage. When I say my relationship with Steve made me feel human, don't take that metaphorically. I did not feel like a human. I felt my insides were made of metal and that things that happened to other people, the feelings that other people had were not part of my life. I believed I was something else. It was these two relationships with Steve and with Will, which brought me not simply to think, but to feel that I'm human, capable of loving relationships. Today, Steve and Will are my closest friends and I think of them as my true pillars. But there was a point where I thought I may have lost Steve. I suffered from an episode of Capgras syndrome in which you believe that a person has been taken over by someone or something else. That person is not really that person. This ha episode happened to me in the mid nineties. So um, in addition to thinking that Steve was, had been taken over, I also thought that my analyst, Dr. Uh, Kaplan had been, and this episode was really devastating to me. The only way to understand why the Capgras was so disturbing to me is to understand that these relationships with, with Steve and with Dr. Kaplan were a tether to my own humanness. If I lost these ties to my humanness, I might really no longer be human. Again, I'm not speaking in metaphor here. When you hear your patients talk in this way, don't assume they're speaking in metaphor. So I've been talking here about myself and relationship, and I'd like to return to say a few more words about my relationship with my mental illness and how I conceptualize that relationship. When I moved to Los Angeles from New Haven, my analyst and I developed a way of talking, a sort of heuristic about my illness and my relationship to illness. There were, in our manner of speaking, three me's. And we're not talking about multiple personalities, we're talking about aspects of, of me, of one, one person. So the three me's were Ellen, Professor Sachs, and the lady of the medical charts. I could not integrate these three aspects of myself. How could I be a thinker of a big thoughts, an academic, if my mind were so damaged? How could I be both Professor Sachs and the lady of the medical charts? And where did Ellen fit in all this? What took a huge amount of effort and was ultimately self-defeating was to keep them separate. I wasn't sure who was the real me. This confusion expressed itself in an intense ambivalence for taking my medication. For many years, my motto was, quote, the less medicine, the less defective, unquote. Steve was a virtual saint as he spent literally years of our relationship going through time and time when I tried to get off my meds with disastrous results. It wasn't simply that I didn't like the side effects of my psychiatric meds. The need to take medication reached to the core of my identity. If I could get by without medication, I wasn't really mentally ill and the lady of the charts would disappear. Only Ellen and the professor would be left as a real me. This cycle culminated in one final effort to get off my meds several years after I've been on the faculty at USA. Reading from the text. While White had supported me many times in my efforts to get off medication, which I undertook with great gusto and failed miserably at each time. One battle between Kaplan and me uh, concerned the use of medicine. Early on, we really locked horns over this. Kaplan thought that I stay on meds and get on with my life. And as I said, for me, the motto was the less meds, the less defective. Part of the way that I could prove that I wasn't mentally ill, which I resisted mightily for many years, was to get off medication. And so I kept trying and trying and trying. I decided to make one last effort to get off put a lot of supports in my place and was very determined. So I started the reduction. I hid what I was feeling when I started feeling bad. The days and nights were harder now. The sheer physical effort of containing my body and my thoughts felt like trying to hold back a team of wild horses. Sleep was spotty and filled with dreams that left me awake and sweating in terror. Nevertheless, I dropped again. Months before I accepted an invitation to present a paper at Oxford and by the time I boarded the plane for home, I was a complete wreck. When I walked into Kaplan's office my first day back, I headed straight for the corner, crouched down on the floor, and began to shake. All around me were thoughts of evil beings poised with daggers. They'd slice me up in thin slices or make me swallow hot coals. Kaplan would later describe me as, quote, writhing in agony. Even in this state, which he accurately described as acutely and floridly psychotic, I refused to take more meds. The mission is not yet complete. Immediately after the appointment with Kaplan, I went to see Dr. Martyr, that's his real name, a schizophrenia expert who was following me for a movement disorder caused by the meds called tardive dyskinesia or TD. He'd never seen me ill before and had been under the impression, and I hadn't disabused him of it, 
that I had a mild psychotic illness and that my primary concern was avoiding or minimizing tardive dyskinesia. Once in his office, I sat on his couch, folded over and began muttering. I was disheveled. I couldn't remember when I'd slept or what I'd eaten. When had I bathed? In Oxford before? Did it matter if we were all gonna die anyway? Anyone who walked into that room would have thought Martyr was treating a schizophrenic street person. Weeks later, people told me that's exactly what I look like. Head explosions and people trying to kill. Is it okay if I totally trash your office? You need to leave if you think you're gonna do that, said Martyr. Okay, small, fire on ice, tell them not to kill me. Tell them not to kill me. What have I done wrong? All the explosions, hundreds of thousands with thoughts, interdiction. Ellen, do you feel like you're dangerous to other people or to yourself, he asked. That's a trick question, I said. I don't think you ask a mental health law professor if she meets the statutory criteria for commitment in the language of the statute. I'm not sure how you do it, but not that way. No, it's not a trick question, he said. I'm serious. I think you need to be in the hospital. I could get you into UCLA right now and the whole thing could be very discreet. Ha, 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 you're offering to put me in the hospital? Hospitals are bad, they're mad, they're sad. One must stay away, I'm God or I used to be. My husband Will made a marginal note right there. She said, he said, did you quit or, or were you fired? And then who would have the authority to fire God? Forgive me for I know, know not what I do. I give life and I take it away. I really think a hospital would be a good idea, Martyr said. No, thank you, oh so very much, I said. All right then, but if I were you, I'd stay away from work for a while. You don't want your colleagues to see this. Thanks, bangs, bang, bye, see you soon. Oblivious to the look on his face, I left. The next morning, I dragged myself to my office, my hideout and refuge. I ran into my colleague, Ed, in the hall, and he quickly figured out what was happening. Ellen, what the hell's going on? I thought you were kidding at first, but you're not, are you? Does anyone else know about it? Is it okay for anyone else to know? I wouldn't mind telling Michael, I said, not the archangel and our colleague. Suffice to say that Ed eventually brought me home, showing the good judgment to follow my doctor's advice rather than tackle me to the ground and take me to the ER, as others, including Ed's uh, internist uh, wife, were recommending. Eventually, I acceded to everyone's demand that I take more meds. I could no longer deny the truth, and I could not change it. The wall that kept me, Ellen, Professor Sachs, separate from the insane woman I'd seen in that mirror long ago, lay smashed and in rooms. And then another event pushed me past the point of no return to accepting I indeed had a mental illness. I got on a new drug. Reading from the text. Because of the risk of my meds, Kaplan suggested one of the new classes of antipsychotics, a drug called olanzapine. Uh, uh, it's a very, very good drug. In the end, I was on very high doses and was switched to something called clozapine, which is uh, the catalog in terms of efficacy, but also uh, very cumbersome. Anyway, but the change with originally with the, with the Zyprexia was fast and dramatic. First, the side effects were much less than with the Navin. More important, the clinical result was, not to overstate it, like daylight dawning after a long night. I could see the world in a way I'd never seen it before. The illness was still there, but it wasn't pushing me around as much as it once did. Finally, I could focus on the task at hand, unencumbered by the threat of lurking demons. The most profound effect of the new drug was to convince me once and for all that I actually had a real illness. For 20 years, I'd struggled with that acceptance, managing to hold on to the belief that basically, there was nothing unusual about my thoughts. Everyone's mind contained the chaos mind did, it's just that they were all much better at managing it than I was. My problem, I thought, had less to do with my mind than it had to do with my lack of social graces. I wasn't mentally ill, I was socially maladroit. Of course, that wasn't true. There's no way to under overstate what a thunderclap this revelation was to me, and with it, my final and most profound resistance to the idea I had a mental illness began to give way. Ironically, the more I accepted I had mental illness, the less the illness defined me. It became accident and not essence, at which point the riptide that had kept sucking me in set me free. So I was finally able to integrate the three parts of myself. I was indeed Ellen, the professor, and the lady of the charts. It was making peace with the lady of the charts, my mental illness, that allowed Ellen and the professor to flourish and enjoy the many wonderful relationships that have blessed my life. I've been enormously gratified how my memoir, The Center Cannot Hold, has been received. With Mondays, as was mentioned, from the MacArthur Grant, I founded the Sachs Institute for Mental Health Law Policy and Ethics at USC. The goal of the Sachs Institute is to translate ideas into action to better the lives of people with mental illness. We are your sisters, your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your colleagues, and your friends. We want, in the words of Sigmund Freud, what everybody wants, to love and to work. So with a little help, or perhaps a lot of help, uh, from, uh, from our friends and colleagues, uh, those of us who suffer with mental illness can find a life worth living. Thank you very much. So um, should I talk about 
some policy implications or should we go straight to questions and talk about the ones that you're interested in? We would love to hear about policy implications. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I'm going to speak. For, there, there are you know three or four things that I think are kind of important. Uh, one is um, how treatment is so important. So I, um, I haven't been told that I'm unusual to be so high functioning as someone with schizophrenia, but in fact I have done a study with Steve Barter and others at UCLA and USC on quote high functioning people with schizophrenia. We had two MDs, two JDs, a PhD candidate, and a full-time student, a full-time teacher, a CEO of a not-for-profit. So there are people with mental health challenges out there. It's just that the stigma is so great that people don't come forward. Um, so, uh, so the first thing is, uh, God, I lost my track of thought. Um, uh, yeah, that that lots of you know lots of people with uh, with mental illness. Um, and we ought to provide care to people with mental illness. And I mentioned to Steve Martyr, I said, how many, what do you think is the percentage of people who have schizophrenia and are high functioning in my our sense, managerial, technical, prof professional? He said, I don't know, Ellen, the real question is how many could be if we devoted proper resources? And I think that's exactly the right answer and we need to devote resources. I will get someone in an audience after a speech saying, you know, I can afford to see my patient uh, every three months for 15 minutes to discuss meds, and you see your doctor five days a week. How on earth is my patient supposed to do as well? And I, I say truthfully, I, 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 it's true. You know, I have had a lot of resources, and I'm very fortunate. Um, I, I have some survivor guilt in a way, but I'm not that I'm going to give away, uh, you know, the, the benefits that I've had and the, the help that I've had. Um, so one is getting more treatment. The second thing is I think we need to learn how to use less force. So I don't think we wanna figure out more ways to force people to take care, because after all, that's an unsteady or unstable solution. Once you stop administering the force, the person has no incentive not to go back. So we wanna get people to um, buy into having an illness and needing treatment, or even if they don't buy into having an illness, we'll take treatment. You can say to someone, I get that you don't think you're ill, because 50% of people with schizophrenia don't, but you're complaining about sleeplessness and jitteriness and stuff like that, and these meds can help with that. Why not give it a try? Um, so, so uh, uh, the third thing is um, that helped me is uh, my my academic life, my work life. So when I'm writing a, an argument or a counter argument, the crazy stuff recedes to the sidelines, and I've noticed that I have most of my symptoms at night, which is a kind of unstructured time. So that's kind of important as well. Um, anyway, we want to try to figure out a way to get people to want care instead of using force. And I have a study in mind where you'd have one group would be people who get on meds and they're um, committed immediately and stay on them without any resistance. And at the other end are people who uh, are resistant. They don't get on them or they keep trying to get off of them or whatever. And then the third group are people in the second group who tip to being in the first group. Um, so they change to not wanting meds to wanting meds. And I think it would be really cool to study what helps people tip so we can help people you know, tip sooner and, and get well sooner. Obviously, there are going to be people who are competent and mentally ill who don't want the treatment, and we have to respect competent choices. You know, that's just, that's just the way the world is, and it is the way the world should be. But we want to work together with people to get them care. Um, and then the third thing, you know, that that helped me was was work. You know, that's been very important to me. Actually, my high functioning uh, stu uh, subjects in my in our study, I would say 19 out of 20 got great gratification about their work, made them feel feel good, it made them feel useful, it made them feel productive. One person said, "Hate it, wouldn't do it, except for the fact that my family needs the money." Uh, a lot, sometimes people say, oh, people with schizophrenia or mental illness, they don't want to work. Well, that's not my experience. We, we do want to work. So that's, uh, that's the second point. The third, mechanical rate restraint is something I'm very interested in. Um, so I, I did my law school note, which is a student article on mechanical restraints. And I remember bringing my note to my professor, who was a psychoanalyst and a law professor, and said, you know, Dr. Stone, so don't you think that... Um, Restraints would make people feel, you know, in pain and undignified and degraded. Just, Ellen, you don't understand these people are different from you and me. They're psychotic. They don't experience restraints the way we would. 
And I didn't have the courage in that moment to tell him that, no, we're not that different from you. We experience restraints. The restraints is extremely traumatic and toxic. And it's only by othering us that you allow yourself to do this to people that you wouldn't want done with yourself or with your own family members. Um, so I, you know, I would, uh, England, by the way, has largely not used restraints for 125 years. So I think we should study what they do. Um, but I would, if I were going to write a restraint law, I would, you know, do several things. I'd limit it. I'd change the uh, liability incentives. I'd procedurally burden it. Um, and I would actually get rid of uh, restraining someone's bed, spread eagle to a bed. I've never, I've been fortunate to have never been abused, but many patients have been abused and tying them spread eagle to a bed is going to be very triggering and, and traumatic. Um, so uh, so that, that's my thoughts about restraint. Very quickly, I'll talk about what I'm working on right now. I'm working on studies of supported decision-making is one study and another is supported decision-making and psychiatric advanced directives. And the first one we've recorded four medical centers, USC, UCSD, Downstate SUNY uh, and uh, USC, UCLA, UCSD, Downstate SUNY. Um, and we're asking people to pick people in their lives that they'd like to have as supporters and they're making their decisions. And then we're gonna study who people pick and why and their satisfaction with the decision-making process. Ultimately, it's the patient's decision, but maybe having support can help them make a better decision. So the first one is four medical centers. The second one is uh, four or five um, community mental health uh, departments in California. So we have big, we have urban and rural and big and small, and we're studying psychiatric advanced directives where people lay out in advance what they want to happen to them in terms of their hospitalization and medication and who to notify and you know where to find out what they have written in their psychiatric advance or you know all those kinds of things. So we're studying that that as well. Um, we're just getting started. So we're you know we're running the subjects right now. I'm very excited to see what the result is. You know the hope is that um, you know, it turn out to be feasible and desirable and it would really change the way we deliver care. And the best thing is it would render more people or return more people to being the architects of their own lives. And, and that has to be a good thing. So that's, that's my policy stuff and I'm happy to discuss questions. Well, great, thank you so much for telling us what you're working on. It really is so fascinating to hear about. Um, so, <laughs> For now, we're going to um, ask some questions that our book club came up with together. And then after we've asked a few, we'll, we'll go ahead and open it up to everybody else who has questions they'd like to ask. Sounds good. All right, great. So um, our first question that we wanted to ask you is how did you feel after writing um, The Center and how did it help you contextualize your life with schizophrenia? Uh, so, you know, when I decided I wanted to do this book, um, I talked to a friend who was a geriatric psychiatrist and an older woman herself. And she says, Ellen, do not do this or do it under a pseudonym. Do you want to become known as a schizophrenic with a job? And I thought, you know, I, that's not what I want to become known as, but it would just send the wrong message that this is just too awful to say out loud to do it under a pseudonym. And in retrospect, I, you know, I did the book and I got mostly very positive responses to it. And my friend in the end said, uh, you know, I, you were right, I was wrong. It was a good thing to do. Um, so writing the book, uh, writing the book was kind of interesting. Um, so you said, what, uh, writing the center, what was the second thing that you said? How did it help you sort of contextualize your life with schizophrenia? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it sort of, um, it sort of told the story of my life with schizophrenia and it helped me think about my past and how it led into my future and what helped and what didn't help um, and that kind of thing. Some people say, wouldn't writing something like that be incredibly traumatic? And what I say is, and this is much more severe, the analogy is much more severe, is Holocaust survivors. Some of them go back to the camps and want to take in the physical space, what it was like, how was it? And some people want to say as far away as possible. For me, it's sort of interesting that writing, writing the book wasn't traumatic or toxic. In fact, it was kind of interesting and kind of fun. On the other hand, there's a psychiatry professor at UCLA named Ken Wells, who's also a musician, and he did an opera 
based on the center cannot hold. Um, and it's largely focused on me being restrained. And that really was painful, which is only to say that he really did a good job of capturing that moment. And I would encourage all of you to look, look that up if you want. Uh, it's a really good, good, uh, good opera. So that's kind of cool. Um, but, you know, having the mental illness, I guess some people are lucky they'll have an episode and then that goes, be, it's behind them and they never think about it or live with it again. I'm, I assume that happens sometimes, but with me, it's part of my life. Um, and, you know, accepting, understanding it and accepting it makes it much less front and center, much less important. So, uh, so writing the book was actually a good thing for me. That's incredible. We'll have to check out the opera. Um, yeah. <laughs> our, our next question for you is, um, what was the importance of the psychotic episode at the law school, the Yale school, the Yale Law School Library, and what is it about this experience that really separates it, so that it, you know, it's the prologue of the book. It's something you talk about later in the book. It's in the the talk. What is it that really stuck out to you about this experience? Well, it was a very uh impactful experience. Uh, it was, I guess, the first time I became forwardly psychotic in front of anyone other than a therapist. So that made it unique and, and important. Um, actually, my, one of the people on the roof was named Rebel. And when I decided to write my book, I learned that he was a, a uh, entertainment lawyer in LA. So I consulted him you know, to represent me. And I said, you're in my book. And he said, really? I said, yeah, remember the scene on the roof of the Yale Law School? He said, how could I forget? <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Um, so it was kind of the first time, it was a pretty you know, kind of colorful time to make it sort of, you know, in terms of making it interesting or whatever in a book. Um, I don't think it was that different from, from, other, from other episodes. I mean, uh, I mean, there were times when it was less public, but, uh, you know, in, in a sense, the same kinds of feelings and thoughts and concerns and worries and delusions, you know, took place in all the different times. Um, so it was just, you know, one, one episode among many and an important episode. Our next question for you is, how have you seen the stigma behind mental health change since you've written The Center? That's a really good question. Sigma is incredibly important, mostly because it deters people from getting care and people shouldn't have to struggle, but they will mostly if they don't get care. Um, I think stigma may be getting a little bit better. I mean, this is very anecdotal, but in my mental health, in my Sachs Institute class, I have the law students write essays about why they're interested in doing mental health law stuff. And I would say over the last 10 years, um, 80% self-disclose as having illness or having illness in their family or close friends. Although for the first nine years, when we go around the room to ask people why they're interested, only one person ever self-disclose, which is kind of stunning because law students are supposed to be all about dignity and liberty and you know uh, those kinds of things. Uh, but it was just so awful that people didn't say it. This past year or year before, because this, this year's an off year, um, out of... Uh, 10 people, eight people self-disclose in the first meeting. And I thought that was really cool, including one person who said, I've never said this out loud to anyone outside my family until today, I'm bipolar one or I have bipolar one. So, you know, anecdotally, there are things that are changing. Um, I think people are more aware of uh, mental health issues. Law school is very stressful, exquisitely stressful, especially in the first year. And before the pandemic hit, we would have a counselor on, on staff, you know, one day a week, nine to five for anyone, students, faculty, staff, to come and get support and referrals and stuff like that, which I think is good. Harvard presumably does that five days a week, you know, and Harvard obviously more, much larger and uh, wealthier than we are, but it seems like a really good, good thing to do. Um, stigma, you know, stigma also, there's self-stigma. So when, uh, I met Glenn Close, the actress whose sister's bipolar and her nephew's schizoaffective, and she did a public service announcement of people walking around Grand Central Station with t-shirts that said schizophrenia, sister of someone with bipolar, et cetera. She gave me a shirt that said schizophrenia. And my first thought was, I don't wear t-shirts to work during the week, but I do wear them on weekends. And I thought, do I really want to advertise that I have schizophrenia? 
And then I thought, I've also had cancer and people wear pin, uh, arm pins, armbands, pins, and t-shirts in solidarity, uh, without pride, with pride and without shame. And we should be there with mental health as well, but we're just not there yet. But, you know, the hope is that with more people coming forward and, you know, especially people in your own age core who, who, are, who are telling you about these things and, you know, asking you to be part of their lives anyway. And I think, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to only be good. Our next question is, why did you choose USC and Los Angeles? Um, the weather? No, not really. <laughs> um, I got into a bunch of schools. USC was, you know, the highest ranked, but the main thing about USC was that it was really strong in uh, health law and mental health law and bioethics and things like that. And also a kind of same kind of orientation as mine, very kind of interdisciplinary law and philosophy, law and psychology. Other places like University of Miami I got in, which was sort of hard because my family's part-time in Miami. So that would have been nice, but they're very crit focused, you know, critical legal studies or whatever, which is fine. It's just not my thing. So it was both the best school and kind of the best fit in terms of, uh, you know, what I wanted out of, a, of an academic position. And it's been a great, great place. It's just so incredible. Student asked the other day when I started, I said 89, and she said that's when she was born, but actually most of them were born in the late 90s. And you guys probably were born over 2000, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don't make me feel too old. <laughs> Uh, our next question for you is, um, how has your experience with psychoanalysis changed during the pandemic and social distancing and have virtual options improved or diminished the standard? So I am very lucky. My psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, who I see four days a week used to be an infectious disease doctor. And he doesn't think that it's contraindicated for me to go into his office and have therapy with him. So I've not changed the way I you know, do my therapy. Um, I think a lot of people said at the time that it's not going to work. You can't do anything. We can't do stuff online. This is just too, too personal, too important. It would be too distancing, but it turns out that you can do it and it, it works fairly well. And that's going to open access to people who live remotely geographic, remote geographically, or don't have any transportation, even if they do live in the city or whatever. So it could have a, an upside as well. Another upside I think in the pandemic is that more people are experiencing fear and anxiety and sadness, depression. And I think that's gonna make them more empathetic to people who suffer with those things because of their illness. At least, you know, that would be a good thing if that happened. Great, and uh, our final question before we open it up to the audience, you, you touched a little bit on this uh, previously, but um, a lot of people have kind of found academia to be this source of stress. But based on your story, it really seems like it's this outlet, outlet for happiness for you. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. No, it totally is. I, I love my work. I go in seven days a week, uh, no matter what. Um, I guess two days of the year I don't go in or Christmas Day and Thanksgiving Day, but every other day I'm there if I'm in town. Um, and I just find it enormously gratifying and fun to like think things through and look at different perspectives and see what studies show and what sorts of things that we could do to make the world better for people. I mean, I just really enjoy, enjoy the work. Um, so it's not a challenge or a struggle. So some people who probably are, are most suited for academics are just traumatized by the junior years because they feel like they have to produce and they don't know what they want to write about and it's so hard and that's tough. And I mean, if you want to do it, sure, that's great. And it's great if you can do it. But for me, it's always been nothing but good, just a lot of fun. There's a kind of funny story. So I had a colleague who had tenure trouble. She did get tenure in the end and she had a place in Berkeley and she invited me to be up there uh, one weekend. And I had just shown her um, a manuscript on hermeneutic psychoanalysis. And she told me that I needed to just throw this away. It was a piece of shit. It, it would really stand in the way of you're getting tenure. By the way, it was published by Yale University Press and everybody loved it. But so I went to sleep that night in her, in her uh, condo, 
her townhouse or whatever. And I woke up in the middle of the night and at the foot of my bed, I saw a little bicycle with a devil riding in place. And I thought, what an appropriate hallucination. <laughs> so. Well, thank you for uh, answering some of our questions. We'll go ahead and open it up now to people who want to ask questions. We ask that uh, if you can raise your hand and we will call on you and I will go ahead and fix the settings so that people are able to unmute themselves. Okay. All right, great. Adam, do you wanna ask the first question? Thank sure, you so Andy. much for being here, Dr. Oh. Sachs. Oh, uh, we're both I'm so Adam. sorry, you're both named Adam. Um, <laughs> uh, Adam uh, Lacroix, you, you can go first. Sorry about that. Um, well, as the other Adam was saying, it's a pleasure to uh, <laughs> meet you and hear from you your wisdom and experiences and uh your struggles have been um i hate saying this but your struggles have been actually very inspiring um for you you mentioned acceptance a lot acceptance of uh the schizophrenia that ails you um was that was that just uh, kind of a clarifying moment or was it something that really took time overall for you just to come to that conclusion that this is in my life and I'm just going to have to deal with it. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like when it first happened, I was like, oh, this is what's going to happen go, going forward. It took a, it gradually unfolded over a long period of time. I mean, as an example, I went 10 years trying to get off medication. Um, and while I wish I'd been smarter sooner, I was glad that I wasn't forced and that I was allowed to come to the decision in my own way in my own time. Um, so uh what's the question again oh it's just if it was uh because i know you, you you mentioned that it was you know a key component of kind of grounding yourself was the acceptance and i was yeah. just curious to hear from you if it was you know this gradual process or just something that kind of was uh you know epiphany but it sounds like it was definitely a gradual process it was, it was pretty gradual Thank probably you that so final much. moment was in fiction's eight but it had been a lot of uh, earlier stuff that led up to my being able to have that epiphany it was, it was really tough. I don't know, do you all have any ideas about why it is so hard for people to accept mental illness versus physical illness? Now I'm being the teacher. <laughs> I would say it's the, the normalcy aspect. I think many, uh, if you see someone in a cast, you assume that's just part of being life. You know, you break a bone, you uh, suffer. Um, you know, uh, I believe that uh, when we have uh, ail ailments of the mind, I think then you're, you're, you feel this uh, dejection from society um, because your mind is, you know, everyone's arm is an arm. It has a tibial and a fibula, uh, but your mind and personality are very unique to yourself. And, uh, if something's not right or normal there, I believe that we kind of interpersonalize it and see it as our problem, I guess. I have a very good friend. One of your questions that I read was, uh, and any other good book, she wrote a book called Manic, her name's Terry Chang. Um, and we talk about passing as normal, <laughs> that she and I do sometimes, you know, to kind of navigate the professional world or social world or whatever without being open. Um, but, you know, would that we could all just be as open as possible without repercussions. All right, now would the other Adam like to ask his question? Sorry about the confusion. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Sachs. I thought it was so interesting when you talked in your book about um, the need for psychoanalysis as an outlet. Um, and the real function that that served in your life and in the lives of others with mental illness. Something that you also mentioned though, when you were talking about policy is the extent to which like our current mental health care systems are so overloaded. And that's part of why we see this turn towards, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, very results oriented, behaviorally oriented treatment. And I guess I wonder in that healthcare paradigm, what do you see as the role of long-term talk therapy? And how do you think we can continue to use it in ways that are productive, but realistic? So it's a really good question. Um, there are 
there's a lot of work on CBT for psychosis and there's DBT for people who have personality struggles, um, you know, and psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic psychotherapy uh, for mostly for people who have, you know, difficulties with life, so to speak, and not uh, for, for diagnoses. Um, for me, you know, the analysis was incredibly important. I, I tried CBT, I found it kind of infantilizing and silly. There are plenty of people who get a lot out of it. So I don't wanna say don't do CBT because it, it's pretty useful and DBT is supposed to be pretty useful as well for personality disorders. Um, but the, what, why I think uh, uh, analysis is important I can ha kind of like have a whole list of things and it's sort of, it's a, it's a $50,000 question, not only with analysis, but with CBT and all the different kinds of treatments, what's the mechanism of its working? And the first thing is that um, uh, mental illness is uh, negatively impacted by stress as most illness is. And psychoanalysis can help you understand and address that stress. Second, it, um, develops in a person a quote observing ego where you stand back and observe what's going on in your mind and figure out you know what you can do in response. The next thing is the outlet thing. If you have a place where you can go and talk about things that are scary and upsetting and sad, you, you don't have to new, do that in quote your outside world. You know, you keep that in your in your treatment and that will have good professional implications. Um, interpretations can help. So there are three views. One is that psychotic symptoms are random firings of neurons that don't have meaning. Second view is they have meaning. They tell the truth about your psychic reality, but it doesn't help to talk to people about that. They just can't understand it or make sense of it or make it meaningful. And then the third view is that it sometimes is meaningful and, and, and a good thing. And that, for me, I was in that last group. And we'd have to like really look at to see what groups most, most people would be in. Um, Hard to study analysis, of course, because it's very long-term and very intensive. So that's that's one of the difficulties. Um, and yeah, we're so overloaded in the in the mental health sphere that, that we have to find ways to do things, you know, fast, faster and better. There are short psychodynamic treatments, I think, which have have some promise. Uh, it's sort of interesting. There's a study of depression. So at time T1, a depressed person gets uh, um, uh, antidepressants and, and another person gets uh, ECT. I'm not positive I'm getting this right. Anyway, when after, after several weeks or months, they do brain scans, second brain scans of the people. And it turns out that both of the camps had brain changes in exactly the same ways, even though they were very different interventions. So that was kind of interesting as well. Um, but you know, the fact that you know, there's so much mental health and there's a lot more now because of the pandemic, I think, um, and not that, many access, not that many resources for people. And often the resources are unaffordable people, for people when they, when they exist. And it's a, it's, a real, it's a real shame, I think. Victor? Hi, yeah, uh, Dr. Sachs, first of all, thank you so much for writing this book. Um, it was really informative for me to like understand schizophrenia in such a qualitative manner as opposed to just reading in a textbook, a list of symptoms. And I appreciate you putting yourself out there so like holistically, like, like you talking about it especially made it feel so personal and real to the point that I forgot that it did how real it gets. So thank you so much for like uh, immersing us in this, like how it yeah. I appreciate that, thanks. But um, a question, the question that I had is that uh, um, the current zeitgeist on like neuroscience and psychology kind of diminishes psychoanalysis and especially Freud. Right. And I was wondering how you, how you like interpret that current, like the culture of saying psychoanalysis and Freud are dated models that shouldn't be considered. I think most people think that even the most classical psychoanalysts that Freud got some things right and he didn't get some things right. And that's what I think. I mean, I think he got right transference. I think that happens with, although he didn't think it would happen with psychotic people, but I think it's very important. I kid around that I used to think my analyst was evil and the devil and I had to be careful or he'd kill me. 
And now I just think he doesn't like me. <laughs> so I went from a real psychotic transference to a real neurotic transference. Um, yeah, and there, there are, I think there are things in Freud's you know, theory that people don't accept right now. But I think there are some things that people do accept, or at least psychodynamically oriented therapists do accept, like transference and like dreams can tell you stuff about a person's mental state. Um, and like, you know, um, uh, challenges around dealing with authority as one example. How can we understand the role that plays in your life and why it's there and that kind of thing? I mean, I think, I think you can learn lots of stuff uh, in analysis, and, uh, but not, I don't think people think that, you know, how Freud conducted an analysis would be the way that we would do it, we would do it today. Sarush? Um, hello, um, thank you again for being here. Um, my question was that I think, I'm not a policy major or anything, but I think like a big part of changing policies and like removing stigma is sharing your lived experience and your personal narratives. And I think like you've done a fantastic job of sharing your experiences with your mental health. But I think oftentimes that there's like a big disconnect from other people understanding it because sometimes it could be like a different reality that people can't experience. So. How do you overcome how do you overcome like telling your story and sharing your narrative and how do we think how do you think us as a society can go to a better place of under, understanding mental health in, in those terms um yeah i think people telling their stories you know people from all different age groups and all different socioeconomic status and all different you know uh, studies you know just people talking about it being open about it i think is going to make it possible for other people to be open and it's always better i think to be open than to have a huge secret that kind of is a barrier to, to a friendship if you can't really talk about something like that um so i you know i just i just think as you were saying telling telling the story is what is what d decreases stigma so that people being willing to do that it's you know it's a it's a fraught thing though. I mean, again, I have tenure, I don't have to worry, but if you're a junior faculty member or you're a PhD student, you know, people get anxious, people, you know, rush to judgment when, you know, everything really is fine and all those kinds of things It can really be impactful. You know, sometimes people say to me, you know, I'm applying to law school or medical school, should I self-disclose? And I always talk about the pros and cons, you know, why it would be good and why it wouldn't be good. The real answer is you probably shouldn't unless you have to because there are gaps in your resume or you know that kind of thing um, but that's a that's a hard thing to say and it's a personal decision so i don't say this is what you should do but that's what i would do so when i applied to um law school uh every law school i applied to had a question of do you have a mental illness that you think could impair your ability to practice law i think that's what the language was that's the bar language as well and I, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, I do definitely do have a mental illness, but if I'm treated, you know, I can be as, you know, stable and sane as anybody and, you know, maybe have more interesting ideas because of thinking outside the box a little bit. Um, so, uh, so, so when I applied to, to law schools, they asked that and I would always say no, because I felt like the answer was no, that I could practice without hurting people or whatever. But one of the schools, I guess it was Stanford said, do you, have you ever had a mental or emotional problem that caused you to diminish your, uh, your workload? And I had to say yes to that because I definitely, there were times in England when I was not functional and not working. I was in a degree program, so nobody kicked me out or anything, but I was unable to, to function. And I think, you know, to the, the prudent thing is, you know, to the extent you can not say some of that stuff, the better off you are. But again, that's, a value choice and a personal decision. Dr. Walsh. Hi, so, so my question really is centered around kind of policy and follow the money. And uh, you know, mental health funding is abysmal compared to other aspects of federal government funding. And, and then that trickles down to pharmaceutical company funding for mental health. And then even my son who sees a psychiatrist, 
he won't take health insurance anymore uh, because the way it's divvied up for mental health. So what's the solution to get better funding for mental health? You know, it's an incredibly important point. You know, if we don't put resources in, we're not going to be able to do all the things that we hope we can do if we do put resources in. Um, I mean, there. Are, I mean, what some things we should do is people like you and me who can get funding to do research that helps on these issues. You know, that that will make make a, you know make it make it make a dent. Um, as an example, what I was saying, our studies on supported decision making and psychiatric advanced directives. Uh, the first one is being funded by a, by a foundation. The second one is being funded by the millionaire tax in California. Um, I don't know if you remember that. What happened was that anyone who made a million more had to devote 1% of their income to a novel um, psychiatric or psychological program or intervention or whatever. Um, and that's where we're getting our money to do the psychiatric advance directives. So that's, that's one way. Drug companies do give money. I mean, drugs aren't the answer for everything. And even when they're partly an answer, they're not the whole answer. And, you know, so I'm, I'm not upset that we're studying drugs. I, wanna, I want us to get the best drugs we can. Um, to the extent that it diverts all funds from anything else, that's a problem. And we need to face it as a society and as a, a group of um, uh, researchers and, and uh, people who do studies. But, I mean, you are right. The money that we put in is just horrible. Do you have any ideas about how to make it better? Yeah, it's so political. I, you know, um, yeah, it, it's first of all, you know, to mental health. You know, it's it's. Um, I was as a kind before. It's it, it's kind of viewed as a weakness, and nobody wants to be part of that weakness. And. Uh, um, you know, and, and in the other aspect is there's kind of a fear, you know, so we fear getting cancer, you know, we fear getting Alzheimer's disease. And so, so that's an easy sell to Congress and, and the Senate. Okay. Um, and I, I just don't understand why people don't, don't have the same ability to, to grip what's going on with mental health, you know, and it's just, right. uh. But you know, and, and then you know, in terms of drug development, there's so much money to be made from cancer yeah. research. It's yeah. so much money, and the turnaround time is so quick. Whereas, you know, I, I know Pfizer and Sandoz and a couple of other drug companies suspended so many aspects of mental health research because the turnaround time, the profit margin was so slow in, wow. devel in drug development. Whereas, you develop a new cancer drug, you, you know within six months that the five-year survival rate is improving or just your, you know, your cultures are improving. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, how do we get this awareness? How do we, how do we bring it out? You know, I, I certainly, some of the students here today, I was invited by students to take my neuroscience and mental health classes and, and I make it primary education as freshmen that they embrace it. <laughs> and accept it, you know, and in, in, you know, and, and I use myself too, I'm self-deprecating. I have the most profound ADHD you would ever, ever see in your life. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and like you, the, the perfect venue was the classroom. Yeah. You know, so um, I don't know. So there, there's, I, I kind of went off on a lot of tangents showing my ADHD right now, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just getting people on board. How do we get people on board? Yeah. yeah. In the beginning, uh, we have an orientation. We're not doing it this year, which we started doing, and there would be different topics. Um, and one of the topics was mental health and, and law school. I mean, as I was saying, law school is exquisitely stressful, especially the first year. So I spoke a student who was willing to come out as bipolar, he spoke, we had an, an alum and she spoke, and we may have had uh, someone from the student health, I don't exactly remember, but we talked about all of this and it seems that you know it made some difference So the law students to put together a, an organization or a club or whatever, it's called Law Students for Better Health. So we're making some inroads, but it's slow and it's hard.
I, I, I also uh, chatted you. My, my wife took your mental health class at USC Law School in 1993. Oh my I, goodness, what was her name? Uh, her, name's that... Julia, Julia, her name back then was Julia Richards. And uh, yeah. oh, my she, she, she graduated Order of the Coif. I think she was oh, number three right. in the class and uh, said it was the best class ever. Best class ever. Oh my goodness, thank her. That's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Is she practicing law or? She, she did for many, she actually went to Pillsbury Madison Sutro, Lilith McCall, and, and like you said, the, the grind was unbelievable. It was just, yeah. it wasn't compatible with yeah. having a healthy life <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah. children and things like that. And uh, she, she was managing counsel for the Olive Club for a number of years. And then, uh, oh. and then, um, and now she's part-time faculty over in the School of Gerontology and she teaches, uh, HR courses uh, for us. So, cool, cool. Yeah. Say hi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Some someday post pandemic, she'll have to come by and, and knock on your door. I'd love to. I'd love yeah. to have lunch. Yeah. Okay. And I think I said it at the beginning, but if any of you students would like to chat by email or whatever, feel free. I'm happy to connect. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Valeria? Yeah, um, thank you for being here. I think my question is like, how has your, how has been your relationship with your family and with mental illness and what has been um, the, the most supportive environment that you have found throughout this journey? So that's a really good question. There's a lot of evidence that if people with mental illness have family involved in their care that they do better. I've kept my parents kind of distant from my mental health life. We're very close. I speak to them on the phone almost every day, but um, don't discuss these issues. And my reason is when I became ill, I don't know if I've said this already, when I became ill, I, uh, um, I had already been living independently for four or five years and I did not want to go back to being the kid in my family of origin. And then the second thing is they worry a lot and I don't want them to worry. And the third thing is they don't do support of that well anyway. So there wasn't much in it, in it for me. They knew I broke down at Yale, of course, because they were called and came. But when they read my book and saw that I had multiple episodes since Yale that they didn't know about, they were kind of hurt. And I kind of feel bad about that. I'm sorry that they were hurt, but I still think I made the right decision. Um, but that said, you know, most people do better if their families, if their families are involved. Um, and a lot of times they're not either because the patient pushes the family away or because the family flees. So to the extent we can get people like on the same page and working together, that's a good thing. Thank you. Yes, Iris. Hi, uh, I had a question. Um, I watched your TED talk and you mentioned in there um, that we should address, uh, we should say people with schizophrenia as opposed to uh, labeling someone schizophrenic. Um, can you expand on that and kind of how you see the language around mental illness as mental health changing in the future? Yeah, that's a really good question. I have a, had a friend named Fred Fries who was a psychologist, a PhD psychologist in Ohio who had mental illness and was a big advocate he passed away, but he, he basically used to say, let's stop using the N word, meaning nuts. So kind and well-meaning and smart people who would never utter a racial or an ethnic slur or happy to talk about crazies and lunatics and you know nutcakes and things like that. People just do it without thinking about it. Um, and that's very, that's very painful for those of us who, who struggle. Um, and I think, you know, uh, it's as with other, you know, labelings of people, we need to, you know, educate people and you know, get people to see that this is a problem and to want to change it. One of the studies I'm putting together is about um, changing the name schizophrenia. And we're like having a whole list of other possibilities like Kreplins or Bloilers, similar to Alzheimer's. So you name it after someone who's contributed a lot to the understanding of the illness or uh, altered perception disorder or disorganiza disorganization, just, you know, all these different names. And we're going to see what what people think, and we're going to interview peer, you know, um, patients, family members, mental health professionals, mental health lawyers, 
and see see what we come up with. Uh, it might be that we were going to be talking about this in a in a different way, and that you know that could be a good thing. I mean, schizophrenia also is uh, unfortunate because most people think it means split mind, split personality, and it just it's a psychotic and not a dissociative disorder. It's a complete you know misunderstanding. Um, but words, you know, words matter. So we'll see what people think. Amar? Yeah, I thought that's pretty interesting how you talked about like the terminology of schizophrenia and everything. I'm taking a history of madness class right now. Oh, cool. uh, history of madness, insanity. Who's it? Who's the teacher? It's Professor Paul Lerner. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically he talked about how schizophrenia, it was originally named like dementia precots in America, I think based on like right. prevalent diagnosis. Um, right. but because we were in like World War One or two and um we were like pretty anti-German. We switched to like schizophrenia, which is like the Swiss version. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty interesting and in how like, interesting. it was like the politics of the time that changed yeah. um, the terminology. Um, but I also had a question. So in my history of madness class, we talked about like pioneers of uh, psychiatry, like Pinel or Kreplin, who basically right. they advocated against um, like, like traditional fetters or like chains or um, right. A lot of like the therapies you were talking about, the mechanical strains. Um, right. And then you have people like philosophers, like Foucault, who would come in and say, um, just because Pinel took off the chains, like the physical chains, doesn't mean that his, his taught therapy wasn't also like, it was sort of like mental chains that are now right. imposed. Um, so I was wondering how, is that still an issue in terms of our psychiatrists still like basically placing chains, either physical or like mental, um, on their patients? And have you seen that changing like the past couple of years? Or yeah. So you know, obviously the most obvious use of chains is mechanical restraints, where you tie someone to a bed. Um, so uh, that's changing to some degree. There are some places that use them minimally and there are some places that use them a lot. And it also, a lot, whether you use them has a lot more to do with kind of the ethos of the hospital head people. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, I was restrained a lot in the beginning. So my first two days I was restrained 20 hours a day and then the next three weeks, three to five to 15 hours a day, instead of my chart use restraints liberally. Um, what were we talking about? I'm sorry. Chains, change, change, change. Um, and mental prisons and all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I studied uh, restraints. Um, I think I discussed this already. My, my professor who said psychotic people don't. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I don't. Th I think. Uh, I don't think people. I think. I, I think the idea of mental chains is a little bit misleading because the person has to like commit or invest or be willing to work for therapy to to do anything and i don't think it's not like uh you know clockwork orange where you just you know show them this this thing and it turns them into this other thing and so i think a lot of it is you know buy in by the person and the person has their, their own abilities and deficits and strengths. And um, I mean, I guess if you think that wanting someone to be mentally healthy is confining them and that we should just not do it at all, even when someone asks for it, then I think that what we're doing, you know, is okay. But that's how I feel. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes, Adam again. Oh, yeah, just one last question. Um, so obviously, uh, and I believe it was mentioned before, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has unearthed uh, a lot of mental distress, uh, ranging from young people in college all the way to older professionals. Um, could this be the unfortunate catalyst for mental health advocacy um, to kind of be propelled to the forefront because it seems like um, not only are many people concerned about how everyone is 
handling the isolation um, right now, but they're talking about a second pandemic being uh, a post uh, COVID environment where you have a lot of people who uh, had the veneer kind of pulled off their life and now they're dealing with anxiety, depression, et cetera. Um, could that oh. be, a, you know, the unfortunate catalyst that kind of helps out mental health advocacy in your opinion? Yeah, yeah, no, in my opinion, yes. I mean, I, we don't want people to be ill, but the more people experience things because of the COVID virus, the more they will recognize that, you know, there are people who have these even outside of the virus and how, you know, painful it is and how difficult and how they're struggling. You know, you know how people are able to see or not see many different things. So I can imagine someone feeling that way, him or herself. Uh, and then when it's all over, kind of forgetting about it kind of thing and, you know, still looking down on people who have depression and fear and anxiety. But it, it is one possible upside, I think, um, is that it helps people understand, you know, altered mental states or different mental states that may be painful and require attention and, and, and that kind of thing. So it's a silver lining in a way. But do, you, do you agree with that or do you have other thoughts? Oh, I mean, I, I definitely do agree. I think, um, I think in our new society that we live in, uh, empathy has unfortunately been on the uh, kind of on the decline. But uh, yeah. in my own anecdotal kind of uh, explanation of things, I feel that uh, when you experience something that people talk about, like anxiety or depression, uh, you, they even if it's short term, and hopefully it is. Um, People tend to be more empathetic when they know the feelings of panic and all and depression and and when they hear about it, they'll uh, say, "Hey, we 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 probably need to fund that endeavor." So, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Adam. This is related to what the other Adam was saying, um, because it's very interesting thinking about these kinds of symptoms that maybe were once experienced by a small proportion of the population, but now are becoming very widespread because of COVID, these feelings of anxiety, isolation, depression. Um, and I follow this author, Melissa Broder, who talks a lot about her experiences with mental health. And she was speaking recently about how she feels that the pandemic has been like the Olympics she's been training for her entire life. Uh -huh. um, and she did um, this speaking or this episode of her podcast where she spoke about her panic disorder and all of these things that she's learned in terms of having um, these bouts of intense fear and using the same coping mechanisms every time she thought, oh, I've caught the virus. I'm and going to get my family sick. My family's going to die. And there's that spiraling and it just made me think you know there is we have this division between mental illness and you know the the people who experience mental illness and people who don't but ultimately like there are things that come from mental health care and come from therapy that are useful to everyone and so I guess I wonder in terms of <laughs> not thinking about current restrictions but kind of in a utopian sense what do you think are aspects of psychoanalytic treatment, aspects of you know, cognitive behavioral therapies that everyday people can carry with them? Gosh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't really feel like I, can, I have the answer. I have to think about it a lot and read a lot and learn a lot, but it's a good question. What do you think? I think definitely um, well, just based off of what I read, there's a tendency to, most people don't conceive of themselves as fragile or vulnerable. Um, you spoke in your book about how you had your, I believe it was a hemorrhage, um, yeah. Yeah. and that experience of like the fragility of everyday life, that like being close to death. And I think that we're not socialized to think about that, but people right. with mental illness like operate with an understanding of that fragility um, and I think that kind of a healthy relationship to it where that thing isn't feared 
um, because that's really what Melissa Broder spoke about was like this whole thing of, you know, I'm, I feel panicked. I feel like I'm dying, but I have felt like this before and it mm -hmm. passed, you know, and that ability to acknowledge and accept like extreme discomfort, I think is something that more people would benefit from being able to do. I think I definitely would. I totally agree with you. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone, for all of your lovely questions. And thank you so much, Professor Sachs, for all of your time. It was really meaningful to speak with you. Um, is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? No, just I think it's really great that you're interested in these issues and want to want to do the right thing. Fight on. That's what we say, right? Yes, fight on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We will be sending a recording of this and posting this to our YouTube channel. And if you'd like, we'll be taking a quick little Zoom picture. If you guys want to turn your camera on for a moment, Iris, are you going to take a picture for us? All right. So if you're going to yeah, I will need a picture. All right. Here we go. Three, two, one, cheese. All right, perfect. Thank you guys so much for showing up today. Hey, thank you. Good Take night. Care. Thanks. Bye-bye.